Hello and welcome to another Time to Time series. Today we have a very interesting topic uh, prepared for you. We're going to show you how to do proper quality, uh, product quality monitoring uh, using our anomaly detection capabilities. And we're going to use root cause analysis on top of that to gain insights in your data that will help us with this use case. And we're going to show you how to do all of that from our own team studio. Um, so without further ado, let's get into it. Now, the first thing that we typically do when experimenting with Tim in the Tim Studio um, is to explore the data. So that's also what we're going to start with. And uh, here, our target value that we want to detect anomalies within is called qual quality. Now, this uh, process that is connected to this data set um, is about roasting coffee beans. And they, these coffee beans pass through a set of machines uh, where a roasting process takes place. And there's all sorts of temperatures and uh, humidity sensors that um, monitor the status within the machines. Now, from all of these um, coffee beans, at every hour, a sample is taken and the quality of that sample is then uh, analyzed. Um, and that result is the target that you now see here on screen. And what we want to do with Tim, we want to see if we can uh, detect anomalies within those uh, sample measurements and see if you can then improve the process of this um, quality monitoring. Um, because if there are anomalies in the, in the samples being taken, um, we might want to recheck them to avoid uh, bad quality products being sold into the market or to avoid waste when some uh, samples might be discarded while they were indeed uh, still of good quality. So, a couple of things that we can do here with this data set um, and the business value that comes out of that. And here we can show you with Tim how to achieve that business value from predictive value. So um, if we take a closer look at the quality uh, measurement there, we can see there's um, no clear pattern within the data. So that means that we need to find predictive value uh, within the temperature and the humidity sensors. Um, so we can visualize those as well. If we take a, another look at that, uh, let me put those on the same scale so we can see their interactions. Um, no uh, apparent signal there uh, also visual, vi visually uh, present. Um, so we can of course do this for each uh, and every of the um, sensor measurements. Um, but the main thing is, main conclusion here is that we are going to use Tim to automatically detect any predictive patterns uh, for us and uh, see what it can figure out. And maybe answer or give us a, an answer to the question, is there a predictive value uh, in this data set at all? Uh, well, we'll see uh, after building the model. So this is the data set that we're going to analyze with Tim. It's all been pre-processed already, so we're now ready to, to, uh, to apply data science on this. Um, so let's do that uh, now here within the Team Studio. Um, for the purpose of this um, experiment, I'm going to um, use default settings of Team, uh, except for I'm going to turn on different perspectives. So uh, what this exactly means, you can of course uh, find that out in a, any of our other videos um, or go through our documentation. But basically the way that we look at anomalies can be done from different perspectives. And here's a couple of them that I'm going to turn on, which will be useful in this particular use case. Uh, in any other setting I will leave as is, I will use default settings and let them automatically go through the data uh, for me and um, build the model fully automatically. So uh, we've now uh, set the configuration and the only thing that I'll need to do now is build the model. So I've, I'm sending this data set uh, from Team Studio to our API, to our um, Team Engine. As you can see, there's a progress bar now um, moving forward. So what's taking place, it's the feature engineering and the model building team is going through this data set. And in the context of anomaly detection, it's trying to describe normal behavior of this data. It's trying to find the pattern that's uh, present within. And anywhere where the measured values here in blue um, will be too far off from this uh, normal behavior from the different perspectives. Uh, Tim will indicate those as anomalies uh, and we will see those results showing up shortly. So the whole process of feature engineering and model building, which is the most complex 
um, in time series analytics. That's all um, taken care of fully automatically now. I will give Tim a couple of seconds to finish um, and um, visualize the results here in the studio. There we go. Progress is almost complete. Now, this uh, speed of execution uh, is only possible through the mathematics that we used, information geometry, um, which is uh, the underlying technology and innovation that we bring uh, with them. And there we go. The job is now finished. Our results um, have now shown up on screen and we can start inspecting and uh, see what insights we can gather. So first of all, uh, we have uh, on top of our actual values now in purple, normal behavior. We also see some red dots in the data set. Um, those are our indicated anomalies and we can take a closer look at those as well. Um, but if we zoom in to the data, we can see how the normal behavior is lining up with the um, target value. So that means that we probably picked up a good predictive value uh, from the data, which is interesting uh, how closely it matches up. And then everywhere where Tim finds anomalies, it will indicate those. Um, at the bottom here, we also see an anomaly indicator from each of the perspectives. So there is the residual um, in uh, brown here. There is also the fluctuation perspective in orange and the imbalance perspective. Now, what each of those means, um, uh, we can, of course, discuss in more detail. This is not within the scope of this video. Um, but we can use that to our advantage to uh, pinpoint on to specific ways of um, working on these anomalies and, and um, creating insights from that. Now, another thing is, of course, a visual into the model itself. If we open up the uh, model zoo browser, we can take a closer look at what the model actually looks like and where Tim has found predictive value. So here we see that most of the predictive value is found uh, from these temperature measurements. Uh, also, the humidity uh, measurement has been used. Um, and then interestingly, most of the, uh, or of, if not all, of the temperature measurements from this fourth machine uh, as is indicated in the name of the parameter, um, have not been used. So there's not a lot of predictive value within those temperature uh, measurements, apparently, according to Tim. Something that we could uh, take a closer look at uh, and already an initial insight into the model that we have from the model zoo browser. But let's now take a closer look uh, at the results themselves and zoom in to a specific um, set of anomalies. So if you take a look at uh, this part of the data, we can see um, that there is a drop here in normal behavior where the uh, quality measurements actually move um, along the, uh, the same line as before. So what could this tell us? Well, in this context, um, Tim expects the quality of these batches to be um, significantly lower than they are um, uh, have been found through the sample analysis. Well, um, Tim indicates that then as an on anomaly from each of the different uh, perspectives, almost uh, all of them. So why could that now be? Well, um, well, the residual perspectives, it indicates uh, a big difference between the normal behavior and target, um, be, uh, target value. Um, so if what, what I would do now as an engineer or uh, as a... Uh, someone monitoring this process, I would take a closer look at those specific batches and reanalyze them and see if Tim can indeed validate that this um, quality might be indeed significantly lower. And if that's the case, then we have found, um, um, then we have saved, let's say, uh, another batch, a bad quality batch from being sent into the market. The inverse could also be true if the normal behavior is significantly higher than the um, measured values, that means that the quality should be higher, but it's uh, not. Maybe we're throwing away a, a good quality batch where we shouldn't. Um, so that's how you could use the residual perspective. The imbalance perspective, it shows us um, a longer period of time where um, the normal behavior is different from the uh, target value. So here we see that there is a drop indeed for a couple of samples, and that already starts 
um, indicating imbalance anomalies, um, which means that there could be a change in the process. Maybe um, some environmental, um, somewhere where this machine is standing, there is a, a, a change in the environment which causes differences in the, in the quality of the uh, batches that are being produced. Um, so that might be something worth checking out, where there's a, a structural change happening in your process, um, which could be a maintenance, which could be um, something that you want um, to uh, take action for. So that's how you would use the imbalance. And then there's also the fluctuation perspective. The fluctuation perspective, it shows us when there is um, a anomaly that goes out of ranges of what's expected behavior. Um, so it's a little bit different from the residual perspective. Um, but here we see that the, the anomaly is going too far down um, from within the ranges that we would expect. And um, therefore the fluctuation also um, indicates an anomaly here. Now, how could you leverage that information? Well, it means that there's probably something wrong with the machinery uh, and the equipment itself. So you can use the fluctuation perspective in this context for predictive maintenance uh, as well. Um, and that's how you can interpret these results here visually from the team studio. Now, if we want to take a closer look at why these anomalies are occurring, well, we first need to ask ourselves, what do we consider an anomaly? Because an anomaly is not the same as uh, undesired behavior. There could be um, expected behavior and unexpected behavior. And that's what an anomaly is. Um, and not really um, behavior that you want to see in the machine and behavior that you don't want to see in the machine. There's a, a small difference in uh, what those uh, things are. Now, um, so we can't really exactly say from the information within this data set why that is, but we can get an indication uh, and we can use root cause analysis for that. And to activate root cause analysis, there is um, this toggle button here within the graph that we can turn on. Uh, we can click on the graph when the point that we want to analyze and uh, let them make an anomaly detection root cause analysis calculation. So we'll um, apply um, this button and let them do its calculations. It will now give us a visual that could give us an indication where the anomaly is coming from. So what do we see on the top graph? Um, we can see our the value of our KPI. We can see the value of our normal behavior, which here is significantly lower as we see, um, as we saw also in the graph. And then wherever there are red uh, bottoms, there are uh, anomalies indicated. Now, from the bottom graph, we can see the uh, most significant changes that are happening within our uh, model, in, uh, within the um, features that Tim has created for us. And we can clearly see that this black, um, this black value, which is connected to the uh, predictor candidate called tdata31, so the uh, first sensor of the third machine, um, is significantly going down. Um, from sample to sample. So that gives, could give us an indication that there's something happening there um, at that machine that we want to more closely inspect. So here there's a clear indication. So let's take a look at the graph. Let's visualize that around this sample. Um, it's, I believe, this value. And if we visualize that, we can clearly see there's a big spike uh, within this temperature sensor, um, so which tells us that this is probably the root cause of this uh, anomaly. Um, and now we don't have to go through the entire machinery um, to do our maintenance. We can now can focus on the third machine, take a look at the first answer, see what's happening there, um, and uh, avoid uh, further uh, anomalies or unexpected behavior in the future. And that's, in a nutshell, the process that you can go through to um, use root cause analysis and anomaly detection to analyze this data. Now, the insights that you can gain from that is, of course, uh, you can now apply this in a process, in an automated process for predictive maintenance. You can pinpoint your engineers to whichever um, part of the machinery uh, needs to be taken care of. You can be alerted in time when uh, samples are being measured that might be, um, might be wrongfully um, discarded 
uh, or wrongfully sent to the market with bad quality. So that's uh, all insights that we can gain uh, in this product quality monitoring use case from our anomaly detection capabilities. Now, that's um, in short what we want to show you here today. Um, you can try this out for yourself. Uh, we can share you this data if you're interested in learning more um, and want to try this for yourself in the studio or any other platform where we are available. Um, you can also find more information, more detailed, detailed information of what I just shared uh, in our blog. So we have here a blog post. Uh, you can go there to the product quality anomaly detection user story um, where you have a detailed description of everything that I just uh, mentioned. Uh, you can go through this um, at your own uh, pace and um, refer back to this video in case you have any uh, other questions. Um, and from there, you can, of course, always contact us if you want to learn more, if you want to um, um, receive the data sets and the use case um, and see how we can do similar uh, analyses uh, on your own data in the context of uh, product quality monitoring. And from there, um, we would like to thank you for joining us in this session and we hope to see you uh, for the next time for time series. Thanks a lot.